Hello and welcome to the Mobile Game Dev Playbook. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This is a podcast all about what makes a great mobile game, what is and isn't working for mobile game designers, and all of the latest trends. I'm your host, John Jordan, and joining me today, we have two very familiar faces. So uh, we have uh, Erno Kieski and uh, Wilhelm Boltelenum, both uh, game analysts from uh, Game Refinery by Liftoff. How's it going, guys? Hi, it's going great, John. How are you? Good, yes. Looking forward to this one. Yeah. I'm uh, going great as well, and great to be here once again. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, so th this is going to be um, a, a, a very interesting sort of uh, look back at the history of uh, mobile game monetization, um, and and look forward to the future as well, because that's sort of the point. Looking looking at the big trends, and it's sort of interesting because this is the sort of stuff we've, we've, we've basically we touch upon in every episode. In a maybe like a you know, depending on what game or what project we're talking about, we might talk about certain bits more than others. But this is like a whole dedicated show, just about sort of what's been going on, and I know you. You guys have been preparing uh, in detail so I, I i'm just gonna sort of i'm gonna just sort of let you go ask the question and, and let you guys go on so so uh, what are the interesting trends that have been happening um, over the last two years with uh, monetization yeah sure so yeah a lot of lot of things a lot of different things and topics that we can talk about it's a wide 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 sub subject but i was thinking like if we start maybe a little bit from you know kind of like a higher picture uh, what kind of like a bigger things that are happening in the market that then have an effect on the on the monetization and then go maybe deeper into the like individual features and mechanics and so on so i guess the first one we could a little bit discuss about uh, is quite recent trend of this kind of like a web store monetization coming more and more relevant naturally because of the uh, like the uh, results of the Apple Epic uh, lawsuit case and so on, but now it's really like uh, really starting to pick up and really to starting to be kind of like a visible more and more. It's not super common yet, but uh, if we look at now to the market, what is there at the moment? Uh, the games that have this type of a web store. So basically, just like to get everybody on board and what is a web store so basically it's a it's an online store for where you can buy items uh, buy currency or whatever and then connect your account to that and then you can basically uh, make purchases in 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 a um, website in a web store and why of course uh, this is beneficial is naturally because it's bypassing the uh, the platform fees so you have your apple fees you have your google fees so for devel developers is naturally lucrative and as we know with the with the kind of like a changes uh, that happened with the with the lawsuit uh, you're not directly uh, able to you know advertise and link your your web stores inside the apps nowadays yet but you are now allowed to have them and you are allowed to market them with your emails and, and, and stuff like that as an example. So uh, where we have then seen them. So at the moment, it's mainly used for the kind of like a hardcore, mid-core type of a games, which is kind of natural because usually those are the games that have the most engaged users. They are, you know, going through online and are much more, you know, easier way or like easier to kind of like... Uh, create this type of a store and then the, the user actually find it uh, and, and so on. So, uh, so because you got, if, if you're not able to do it uh, in game, many of the casual players, they, or casual game players, they just play the game and they're not like engaged that much outside of the actual app as an example. And uh, especially, you know, for X strategy games, we have seen plenty of those uh, using it. Sc Scopely is actually a one good example. They have really doubled down. Basically, their whole portfolio now has, I think, like pretty much all of the games have have, have a web store now. Even actually, Yatsi with Buddies, which is a uh, the first casual game that we have seen to have a web store uh, available uh, for for the purchases. And then, if we a little bit talk about like what kind of a web stores there are, so those are the genres that we have seen it the most. Those are the reasons, naturally, why why uh, different companies are going for them. But like the the classic uh, examples of these web stores is that you buy bundles. There are like specific web store bundles, and you it's kind of like an IAP offer inside a game or whatever. But then naturally, you might get it for a better price for the for the co uh, consumer as well. Or um, uh, as, as an example, Supercell uh, sells for Clash of Clans. They you can buy like 
bundle of three battle passes uh, with a cheaper price and then you you like when the new battle pass comes around then you already have the battle pass and so on and so on but then one more like specific example that i want to highlight is actually this web currency or how how kind of like a one of these games are actually or they have an a specific currency that is used only for the web store. So Game of Thrones Conquest, so from Warner Brothers. It's a Forex strategy game. And if you open the app nowadays, if you go inside the game, uh, everything, even inside the game, you have the, you know, the basic premium currency purchase uh, that you can buy uh, whatever diamonds they are inside the game. Uh, every, every, everything in the store are priced with that. But they have now another currency called Gems. And you are not actually able to directly purchase that inside the game. But then if you click that, okay, what is this currency? It just says, okay, this is something, uh, you know, interesting currency, whatever, learn more from our website or stuff like that. So it's, it's kind of like, a, it's not directly advertising uh, the currency, but it is there to kind of like a pinpoint that, okay, there is actually something like this that I can make a purchase. And then maybe I go, uh, you know, o- online and search for it. And, and then it actually, you when you go online, then you find the store and then you start to do some calculations. Those, oh, actually, this is a better price if I buy it from here and then uh, make the purchase with the gems as an, as an example. So they are the first one that we have seen that actually have a specific currency that is tied to the like a web store, not just individual bundle purchases that you you make by uh, you know connecting to your account and so on. But yeah, definitely something that we are expecting to see more and more uh, happening is happening more and more, more and more developers, especially the bigger ones, and like I said, mid core, hardcore games uh, are are moving towards this type of a. Uh, uh, monetization for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. It's one of those kind of like a bigger thing. So if we continue on, then another kind of like a, maybe a bigger uh, thing that is happening mainly of because of the more kind of like a macro level things happening for mobile game market. So we have been talking about in in this podcast for ages and many many times already about hybridization. So not gonna spend too much time time on it. But it's definitely in terms of the monetization something that we cannot skip if we talk about trends in the past few years. So uh, naturally, uh, if you look at the market, basically the hybridization happening from the uh, both sides of the market. So casual games, you know, hybrid casual games, taking elements, you uh, implementing IAP uh, mechanics, tr- trying to make the game like the uh, life cycle of the games longer. But then also. Uh, from the other side of the spectrum, so the hardcore games, basically for X strategy games and so on, are then taking elements from the casual games and uh, other mid-core games in order to kind of like appeal to a wider audience. Because naturally, what drives that, or one thing that drives that, is the the new marketing landscape, scape of harder, harder and harder, uh, you know, harder, harder, you know, uh, advertise targeting as an example. But yeah, uh, definitely a uh, big, big trend that I would see, uh, say uh, uh, happening uh, because of these uh, bigger, you know, events, uh, IDFA changes and, and so on, uh, and uh, affecting the all market on, on both sides uh, in terms of the ad monetization, games, hyper casuals adding, you know, IAP, IAP monetization, and then on the other side, widening the spectrum, so to speak when any sort of game shows uh, sort of success and sort of best practice in, in how to, yeah, you know, here's a technique that seems to work, then it doesn't really matter what the genre is or what market it, you know, there's, it may be a very specific sort of technique, but everyone's going to have a go to see, what well, does that work for us? And I, and I guess you know, with, with all these sort of techniques we, we're looking at, you know, probably there's no one single game that they're all going to work for, but, but actually, you know, you, so, so developers have to sort of, you know, sort of, see 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 what fits for them but actually you know, the interesting thing is over time more and more of these sort of initially quite specific monetization things actually do work more generally in games because the audience has been exposed to them in different ways and and just get you know part of it is just people get used to you know 
well, it's, it's a grip, when, when, when anything comes in to begin with, everyone's kind of like, oh, what's this crazy? Why would I pay for that? And then over time, it's sort of, well, of course I pay for that. Yeah, of course I get much better deal if I, if I, you know, have a subscription going or, you know. Uh, so I think a lot of these things just over time be, just become more relevant and more useful to game developers in the way that, that in the first sort of few months. Yeah, definitely. And it's, you know, somebody always has to be the first, first one to go. And then there are, you know, people following that and, and then, you know, implementing and, you know, uh, then you know iterating uh, on those like same principle ideas that uh, kind of like uh, drive these uh, different things. Of course, like talking about more, more like going going deeper into <clears throat> specific games, like to- talking about iterating. Of course, Archer is really interesting sort of hybrid example of it's a casual game. Usually, usually casual games are really like core game uh, focused monetization, but of course, Archer has the RPG meta, so it's meta monetized sort of as well on top of, you know, on top of that, you're just purchasing more continues or, or stuff like that. And then, uh, talking about casual games in, in, in more, more general, uh, of course, meta elements have been something meta elements coming to casual games have been something we have been talking for a while. And while that's not right, 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 right now, like a massive trend right now, it's been going for a while already, but still some of these games especially kind of if a more light way like Lily's Garden and Homescapes, they have started a little bit monetize their meta layers as well. So on top of those games, monetizing, you know, with energy mechanics, continuous boosters, but on top of that, uh, you, you have direct purchase cosmetic pets in Lily's Garden, for example, from, from uh, progress in a purchase offers, which we're going to talk about a bit later. Uh, then in Lily's Garden, they just added, uh, also, new rewards to their battle pass plans. So instead of, of just getting boosters in your battle pass plan, you're also getting stuff for your meta. So you're getting cosmetic skins for their for the characters. You, and they and just in the recent most battle pass, they also added these uh, decorative Halloween themed furniture skins. So instead of you know you having to choose from the three three basic ones, which are usually always free in the meta layer, you can also now customize those with like this exclusive Halloween. Halloween uh, cosmetics as well. So a little bit of sort of meta monetization uh, coming to casual as well. One thing also is actually quite interesting because like, like we talked about this ad monetized game moving away uh, or like at least hybridizing the monetization model of adding IAPs. But, but to be honest, if you look at the, like the top crossing games and that's naturally where our main like focus is on game refinery. So in there also, it's not a like massive trend to be honest, but still, uh, many many games in the like past year, for example, have also added ad monetization as part of their monetization model. And one genre, for example, not all of them do it, but like many many examples, like Project Makeover, Tune Blast, uh, I think uh, uh, at least two, two, those two games, two dots is the third one, Ladies Guard and. Yeah, they have the same as the uh, Project Makeover has when you can watch an ad to get two extra lives before the level. So Yeah, they, they've been like uh, experimenting now or adding or like making this hybrid model, uh, kind of like trying to monetize the non-payers at least a little bit. So it's of course like risky and like uh, the kind of like a find the right balance so you don't cannibalize your, you know, IAP uh, price points and so on. But there are interesting like in terms of implementation quite interesting ones like the two dots uh, one is i think the most uh, kind of like a unique one basically so if you in that one if you uh, lose a level then you can watch an ad in change exchange of this kind of like a, a reward wheel and then there are chances that you get extra moves or there are chances of uh, i think uh, wilhelm you remember or you have analyzed the games better but it's not even direct that okay you watch an ad then you get i don't know plus three uh, extra moves but they have actually actually added a randomizer mechanic on top of that as well uh which is uh, yeah <laughs> almost almost yeah the single fastest way to to sort of destroy your retention is to is to badly implement ads and i guess sort of generally we've seen that so i think it, it is a sort of that's the hardest balancing act because particularly if you've been running games for a while without ads and then you put ads in yeah it's, it's it really does sort of break the flow um and it's i think it can be and, and there are some games it's just you kind of it, it would just it works better where you would put the ads obviously sort of level-based stuff you know but there are some ways you kind of think 
Wow, <laughs> that's that's so brave. Actually, one game that just like I think a few weeks ago added ads was uh, Kuki Run Kingdom, which is a turn-based RPG where the genre in in the genre itself ads are not common in any any way. But they, of course, Kuki Run is a bit maybe a more casual approach to the turn-based RPG and all the team and everything appealing to a little bit wider audience. Uh, but yeah, they just added ads, and actually we have one. One analyst in the, in the company who is playing it on a kind of like a regular basis, and he was a bit, you know, uh, hesitant on the uh, additional ads, even though when they were only rewarded, they, they are not like interstitial ads or anything like that. But like it felt weird to him, at least initially. Uh, but like, yeah, we, we'll see like uh, uh, if if they are able to, you know, uh, or does it affect the uh, retention in any, any bigger way or or so on? So it's got a kind of that sum up like the whole whole thing you know we have the ad monetization coming and then we have the monetized meta layers and so on. i think like more and more games are trying to you know add additional um uh, monetization streams to their game and additional elements they can monetize and going away from the core monetization to meta and stuff like that so yeah and i guess maybe as well you're seeing a bit more pressure on the monetization side now because people can't ex- necessarily extend their audience in the way they once did by really understanding the ua funnels the ua funnels gone pretty skewy so you're not quite sure if you if it's worth you spending a lot of money because you're not quite sure what you're going to get in so at least if you just sort of assume well if we just some, stick some more monetization into what we've got maybe that's the best way to sort of grow at the moment but maybe that's sort of playing into it a little bit as well it's not necessarily a direct monetization but overall in the casual game so naturally as you know scaling new games is harder than ever and Live ops is becoming more bigger and bigger and more important than ever. Something that we have noticed in in casual uh, games as well is that naturally, not necessarily the the mechanics of the monetization itself, but like how, for example, many level based puzzle games, how they are adding so much events and how they are using those to drive basically players to the same monetization things that you already had or like have been used in the in these type of games for for ages so uh there are so many you know examples of you know for example competition uh trending a little bit on on these type of a puzzle games so it's not pvp directly but having various implementations of kind of like a leaderboard based competition or there are now these one v one competition uh, events also for match three where it feels a little bit more personal kind of like a pushing or like tapping into that competitive motivation as an example then for example tying of course the loss aversion and win streak stuff nothing new itself uh, either but like uh, many 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 uh, the kind of like events that are now built uh, combine these elements uh, for example uh, royal match has a quite recent event where they you know have this competitive element of kind of like a race event that you need to uh, complete levels to beat others or beat uh, levels more quickly than the others. But then actually, uh, there's also win streak, uh, kind of like a loss aversion uh, mechanic built into that. Uh, so if you uh, kind of like uh, lose a level, then you actually go back to the starting line in the race. So it's there's the competitive push, there's the kind of like a loss aversion push. And then naturally, the monet- uh, event itself is not necessarily monetized, but it kind of like exposes players to the your monetization things much, much more, or like incentivizes to go player to kind of like a purchase that extra move uh, as an example. Some people, even in casual games, sort of sort of quite like that competition bit, but clearly other people don't. So I guess it's a way of place- placing it so people who don't like it don't feel like they're missing out on this sort of super cool thing. And sort of, you know, you don't want to encourage them to sort of churn up. But for the people who are competitive, then that sort of little nudge towards them, you know, you you wouldn't normally maybe spend this money playing the game normally. But in this particular sort of mode that you've chosen to be in, then, you know, you're, you're sort of opting in for slightly more aggressive monetization. Or so. so, I mean, with all these things, I think they are very diff- difficult to balance. Exactly. And that's why, like, for example, we haven't seen you know, direct PvP modes in uh, match three that much and stuff like that. But it's the fine balance of like, you know, you have the competitive events that are there to push the players who are interested in it. But then it's really easy to kind of like ignore as well and just play because the progression is made by playing your usual levels uh, and and that's it. So 
So there's no specific PvP mode that I go and play, but I actually just play on my own pace and then I can care about it that, okay, I'm now actually at the top spot with the top rewards uh, and I, I want to play more or then I can just totally ignore it. So it's the kind of like how you bring the competition side or competitive element to the users. Uh, it's not, uh, as you know, in your face uh, in, as in many other genres. Personally, I find this whole sort of the event trend in casuals, like being, because many of these games, like, I know you, you, you're, you're the expert in, let's say, uh, in the township, for example, it basically runs on all these kinds of events. Of course, we have the soon the feature that's coming to the game friendly service where you can actually research these specific kind of events. Like, for example, you want to watch loss aversion events or renovation events and so on. So that's, that's kind of cool. But I think, for example, renovation events are extremely good way of sort of uh, indirectly boosting your monetization because, well, of course, we talk just about the competition. You have the competition elements there, incentivizing you to <clears throat> play more, but also renovation being like, of course, it's going to be super satisfying for you to complete that re limited time renovation mode before it ends. So incentivize you more. But also on top of that, we, we had a lot of these in, in, indirect examples. Some games are also directly uh, monetizing them, or some casual games are directly monetizing their their events. For example, the lost, uh, lost aversion events, uh, at least cooking, uh, cooking diary. So it's one of the top crossing time management games. They have had at least a couple of these different loss aversion events, which is basically directly monetized. So when you, you play these, uh, actually these special event based levels and you have to win five in a row, if you lose one, then you're going to lose the streak and you have to start all over. But then of course, if you, if you lose, then, then you can, uh, purchase uh, extra continue to continue at that streak inside the event. And there's really often in, in, their, in, in terms of cooking diary in their events, they have their own uh, specific uh, energy mechanic. So you have this special monetized energy me mechanic uh, monet uh, monetizing those uh, event levels. So that's kind of interesting um, case as well of direct, directly monetizing your uh, events. And on top of that, to talk about like directly monetizing events, like I would say this is quite rare, but we've seen li it a little bit in, in some of the top crossing games is basically uh, offering you the chance to uh, boost your event rewards as well by, you know, making a smaller purchase, for example, at the start of the event, uh, or when you're receiving the rewards, you get, you get this offer, hey, you want to pay a little, you want to play this, pay this extra few dollars to d double your event rewards. And also there are sometimes boosters at the start of the event offered that, hey, uh, you want double or triple event progression. You can purchase this booster to boost you throughout the event to, let's say, finish your renovations faster. And I guess that's kind of interesting because if you paid for that upfront, it's sort of like, you know, the whether it works or not, sort of having, having the gym membership, the, the whole point is, well, I'll get a gym membership because that will force me to go to the gym and maybe it works. <laughs> maybe it works for Robert. <laughs> but if you paid for that a bit upfront, then you're like, well, I'm going to, at least for the first few days, play that more to sort of get in it. And then any, any monetization offers you get within that sort of sort of loop, because you've already paid for a little bit out front, you sort of feel like, well, that's, I'm getting extra, you know, reward for that. So you can see psychologically how, how, how that would sort of would work for some people. Yeah. And I guess that kind of like, a, it kind of ties into the next topic. So like, uh, we've been talking about naturally battle passes a lot, but actually one of the trends, uh, uh, for battle passes seems to be that like, exactly that kind of like a shorter term event monetization or like shorter term like ev event track monetization so we have seen more and more of these games like of course you have your bigger battle pass that is kind of like overarching for the whole game for example but then this you know shorter line like, i don't know one week event then you have that kind of like a uh, paid reward track and that is basically a battle pass uh, purchasing a kind of like a boosted reward, purchasing a better uh, reward track for your event and then uh, monetize through that. So there are actually many, many examples that have started to do this quite recently all around genres. So there's, for example, Merge Mansion started to do this uh, merge game casual. Uh, Rise of Kingdoms, a Forex strategy game has been, Forex uh, strategy games overall have been doing this for a long, long while. Uh, Call of Duty Mobile's latest uh, kind of like a game mode is this tournament mode, which is a weekend mode that you can only pay, play on weekends that uh, 
uh, it's basically you play these free for all and, and duo modes over the weekend and every weekend there's a reward track and then you can actually buy like better rewards for the weekend with a really small kind of like a price point but basically it's a weekend long battle pass and then clash royale has these monthly tournaments for example as well uh and there basically you're just you know competing against uh, others and getting sc score but in that one as well it's much much more shorter and it's much more you know smaller part than the overarching battle pass that the kind of like a clash, clash royale also has but you can actually um, or like the event itself is monetized that you can purchase this uh, kind of like an extra boost, extra track of uh, rewards for just this one one event. So that is definitely one kind of like a, a thing that or like implementation uh, that we have started to see more and more uh, in terms of the kind of like the idea of the battle pass uh, mechanics. Yeah, I find that like extremely uh, kind of clever way, of course, comes with its own risk and battle passes themselves are not, never an easy balance. But if you, like, of course, we have noticed the, the power of battle pass and the, all the different benefits. So why not try if like, if you want to monetize your event, why not on top of the free rewards add premium reverse on top of that for players who want to, you know, pay. And of course, yeah, as we mentioned, uh, as we mentioned, if you players who can purchase the premium rewards or the premium pass of the event, they are even more incentivized to complete that event and just, yeah, benefits are numerous there. I guess the other thing, I mean, battle passes, they've tended to be, because they've been so popular, they've ended up being sort of quite, quite long in duration. So if you have like a month long battle pass, that's a sort of, that, that's in, in and of itself. I think, you know, all these things, are, the problem, I guess, is because these things become slightly diminishing over, over time. So the first time there's a battle pass, everyone piles in. And then the second time, it's still exciting. The, by the time you're on your sixth battle pass, it's sort of like... <laughs> You know, um, it's not necessarily even if people are engaging in it and, 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 and buying into it, they're not necessarily driving the same sort of engagement that it once did. So sort of breaking it down into smaller bits, it's sort of just giving people that little sort of reminder. Well, here's this extra reward you can get. But uh, you know, it is interesting because I guess the more these monetization things come in, the more it sort of fragments your sort of audience. Because previously you sort of had, you know, if we go back more than two years ago, we had the very simple thing: we had free to play games and in-app purchases, and that was sort of, sort of all there was. You played it with these. You know, ground things out. You spent money to get faster gems, and now you have these incredibly sort of complex economic models that are all sort of linking into each other, and different co cohorts of p people who people who won't pay anything at all. But then there's all these other different layers. So I imagine just in terms of like how you would, from an economic point of view, sort of manage all this sort of stuff. Maybe maybe the sort of the the, um, the, the, the thing you have to be very careful about is is as we sort of already mentioned, the adding a new thing may be great, but if that's going to end up cannibalizing something. That you're not going to realize for a month's time that you're making much more money because uh, just the you know the moving parts in it are, are incredibly complex yeah like you said the especially the more hardcore game you go like it is insane uh the the economies that those games nowadays have and and how complex they they are and even like for those shooter games when you think about ah oh, you're just selling cosmetics uh but like the mechanics inside the game and the the cadence and how they run those events and how different things are like how then the cosmetics are monetized it's gets really complicated really quickly really interesting trend to touch upon our like these uh battle pass like these unique more unique battle pass mechanics as of course like battle pass itself it's nothing new anymore really like the battle passes are in every genre pretty much on mobile uh i think looking at the data over 60 percent of the top 20 percent performing games uh, in terms of revenue in the US have panel passes. So they are like, you know, it's not, not new thing anymore, but we have seen on top of these that we mentioned using battle pass me mechanics in, in events, we have seen actually quite numerous amounts of unique ways to uh, implement battle passes, make battle passes more exciting, uh, bring additional bonuses. So some of these uh, really interesting to, to mention here are, for example, uh, having multiple uh, battle passes in your game. So some like bigger games, let's say like, like Mobile Legends Bang Bang or Hearthstone, where you have your normal mode in, in Mobile Legends Bang Bang, the mode is playing MOBA. Uh, Hearthstone, the, the main mode is just, you know, playing the uh, turn-based card game. But both of those modes actually have their own auto-chess modes as well, like fully-fledged modes. They're so sort of comprehensive modes that 
certainly many of the players can only play specifically those outer chess modes and without caring about the main thing in the game at all because you know there's kind of almost two games in one game so both of those games hearthstone very recently brought a secondary parallel pass plan for uh its um outer chess mode so you know monetizing those outer chess mode players uh, specifically of course other games like afk arena afk arena itself is is a game of massive amounts of different modes uh, it's just well it's a, it's a, almost like a <laughs> kind of like a uh, platform of different game modes uh, nowadays and it has i think three main battle pass plans like three different unique ones and then on top of that uh, different event battle pass plans and so on so there's numerous battle pass plans going on uh, at the same time then uh, another interesting one, so for example, Wild, League of Legends Wild Rift just added in their latest Battle Pass plan uh, this Battle Pass specific currency that you get when you're progressing in the Battle Pass. So you get this currency. And not also when you have completed the Battle Pass plan, you then, well, you can, get, uh, com you can uh, continue getting these Battle Pass levels, which then uh, you get more of this currency. And then this currency is used in the Battle Pass own, Battle Pass's own shop to purchase more of these exclusive rewards. And it's also monetized more by, you can then purchase more of that currency if you, let's say you wanna open, you wanna purchase all the exclusive extra stuff in the shop and you can purchase directly also those uh, that currency. So that's one way as well of monetizing the Battle Pass more, but also incentivizing players to, to level the Battle Pass after uh, completing it. Some of these cosmetic based games where the Battle Pass is really on 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 kind of like a center of everything it's kind of like a one way to increase the spend depth for the really you know whale and hardcore players for your battle pass because usually battle pass it's that like individual one transaction that you make and that's about it but like if you look at for example PUBG mobile there are multiple these type of a similar kind of like a small nuances and tweaks which makes more reason to for example uh, skip the tiers or purchase those tier skips and then you know st still continue get value out of the battle pass system so it's kind of like a increases the uh the spend depth and the kind of like a value for the most hardcore players inside your battle pass system yeah absolutely uh then some additional to quickly mention additional other like things in mecha arena they've added a piggy bank system to their battle pass plan so when you when you purchase uh or when you basically progress in the battle pass, pass, then you also fill your piggy bank at the same time. And when you purchase the premium pass, you then get to, on top of gaining the premium rewards of the pass, you also gain the rewards in the piggy bank. Uh, Dragon Legends Mobile had a really unique one uh, when there's three different kind of difficulties of, of the battle pass plan. Let's say you're a PvP player, you can select the PvP focused battle pass plan. If you're a more casual player, you can focus like the casual focus one so there's that that's that's really unique one uh and then we have seen social mechanics tied to battle best plans like i think royal match had this when 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 you purchase the premium pass you also uh, uh, get give this guild gift to your guild mates uh so that, that's kind of nice and top war had had guild guild focused progressive battle best plans uh and, and stuff like that but i think really interesting ones are the auto renewing uh Battle Pass plans and sort of getting extra benefits from the Battle Pass plans. I think uh, Erno Call of Duty had a really interesting. I guess it ties a little bit on the, the kind of like the overall the subscriptions, but it's uh, it's not that common yet. But naturally, if we think about the Google, for example, they their fee of subscription, like all the recurring subscriptions, they it went down to fifteen percent in the start of this year, as an example, uh, and that's naturally one of the drivers which makes the, like sub implementing subscriptions in some way in your game or more interesting or more more appealing definitely and then we have seen a little bit of this how different companies tie actually a battle pass into an auto recurring subscri subscription because in itself it's kind of a, like a subscription already the battle pass so you are purchasing and then you have kind of like a benefits for a 30 month 30 day period or or whatever but like for example call of duty mobile what they did uh, some months ago is that you can purchase still the individual uh kind of like a season as an iap or then you can subscribe to a monthly subscription it's a bit more higher price point price 
uh, price point than uh, purchasing an individual season. But then you get some even extra benefits, even some more unique cosmetics. You get a little bit of, uh, I think, uh, more more weapon XP in the game. You're developing those weapons and so on. And there are some small like subscription benefits. So now you have an option as a as a player that okay, do I want to pay and buy this kind of like individual kind of like a um, uh, battle pass season or do i want to then subscribe uh, to this subscription i'm gonna get the battle pass but i'm gonna get a little bit more other benefits as well it's a bit more expensive for me but then on the developer side as well if they are getting a higher higher fee uh, like higher cuts of the of the, of the whole revenues it's an interesting kind of like a thing that uh, i would assume that more and more companies will, would try out uh, at least uh, in, in, in to some extent uh, pretty sure, but not not many uh, examples yet. And Call of Duty is one, and then Wildlife has been doing it with their games like Zuba, Zuba and uh, Tennis Class, and, and and so on. Again, sort of subscription as is, is, is a as a sort of model has only only has come about, I guess, as, as broadly the general population has become more used to subscriptions for everything. So you know, it was probably that long ago, but certainly ten years ago, subscriptions were seen as, you know, being sort of quite an odd thing to do for content. And now obviously, you know, Netflix and, and, and Spotify and all that, you know, it's now very common mm-hmm. for people to have the like this is, you know, I know how what my subscriptions are and sort of game subscriptions have been a big thing. So I guess it's all again that's all those things become available as people just become more used to that's how we sort of pay for things. Um and and, and yeah, it's it Although I guess we do end up with this sort of very again going back to the, just the complexity of it. We're sort of when Battle Passes came in, they were the thing, and now you have sort of these, yeah, as you were describing there, Wilhelm, these sort of multiple Battle Passes on top of Battle Passes. <laughs> uh, I, I do kind of wonder that it's you know again it's always I, I guess the broad monetization thing is for, for game developers is they want as many people as possible to to pay something, and they always want. The, they always want to be charging as much as possible to the people who really want to pay as much as possible. That's always sort of the the tension between it, and and I guess the more you chop down the, the sort of the the sort of cohorts of between that, the sort of easier it is to work out what you want to charge at certain levels. Um, but then sort of the harder it almost becomes for for the users to sort of know where they go, because <laughs> I guess still in free to play mobile games, what percentage of people pay anything at all? Um, you know, not assuming watching adverts. I mean, I guess it's still. That ninety-five percent, depending on the genre, ninety-eight percent of people are not paying anything at all. So it's it's kind of funny how how sophisticated it's become for a very sort of, that very sort of small percentage of people. And I guess the other thing about subscriptions as well is I I don't know if you probably don't have any data on this, but if I'm subscribing, I'm only going to subscribe to a certain number of games a month. So you're sort of seeing if you can, if a developer can get someone to lock up in a subscription, then that's sort of really meaning they're going to be probably playing your game and not someone else's game. So that's sort of an added sort of competition thing there, isn't it? Where where you're really using that as a sort of like a you know like a moat or whatever you know, competitive advantage you get over other people's games, which is beyond just what's going on within one game. In terms of battle passes and subscriptions, it's an interesting. There's a really good uh, GDC talk by Supercell when they added this battle pass to their Clash of Clans game. Of course, this is all like always. It's case by case with Clash Royale they had a kind of like a negative effect when they added a battle pass initially and then they figured it out but like it's an interesting in that talk he's talking about kind of like how the actual average revenue per paying user went down but then the converting users actually went significantly up so the revenues were actually higher so it was kind of like a more healthier kind of like a monetization model for the long run Uh, but yeah it's always case by case of course. Uh, then, uh, actually talking about uh, battle passes and especially the cosmetic monetized uh, game, when the next we could talk a little bit about gotcha. So still probably one of the key, especially mid-core, hardcore games. The the monetization mechanic, the main one with the most uh, revenues uh, generated, uh, is coming mainly from the gotcha. Still, like even for the those Call of Duty mobiles and so on, they have those battle passes, but like. If you look at, for example, on those games, where the the most unique and where the most kind of like uh, cosmetics are, they are actually sold through various means of limited time and gotchas and, and mechanics like that. So, of course, these gotchas are not, nothing nothing new in, in, in itself, but like in there as well as in battle passes, there are these kind of like <laughs> different ways that developers are trying to, you know, uh, twist and turn around with the specific, you know, you have your loot box, this is your reward pool, and then 
just pull pull from it and and that it, that's it so uh some you know recent uh kind of like uh more more and more common mechanics that i could uh, mention uh, of course uh, uh, are variations of the P pt mechanics so Naturally, in PT mechanics, we mean basically that if you pull the gacha for multiple times, then you get some some benefits from it. One uh, example that has become more and more popular also in the West, uh, in the China market, it's been a thing for uh, for a long time. But this this kind of like a in gacha shops. So as Wilhelm was talking about, kind of like a battle pass currency. But like now there are many of these gacha types, especially for the kind of like the these top cosmetic games like shooters and so on. So if you pull the gacha, uh, you might get a unique cosmetic or then you also accumulate this currency then, which you can then use in the specific uh, shop inside that uh, one gacha. So it's kind of like this pity mechanic that you are accumulating this currency and then you can actually make the purchase that you want. Uh, so uh, you feel kind of like a go going forward on, on something uh, all the time, at least. Then another uh, actually interesting one. I think we talked about it on the kind of like uh, maybe possible trends of, of this year, like when we had that kind of like a uh, podcast about a year ago uh, about this gacha mechanism was this preview gachas, which was then implemented in FIFA in PC and console. So preview gacha basically means that you can actually see and preview uh, your kind of like a pull before you actually make the decision. Uh, to make the transaction and spend your currency, uh, spend your premium currency. So now there has been actually a couple examples also, not that much yet, uh, but like a couple examples in mobile market, Call of Duty Mobile being one of them. So they have this draw now, pay later uh, gotchas that they are trying out. Uh, it's it's uh, How it works is that basically you can do it once per week. And uh, I think the event lasted for two weeks. So you're going to do it that much. But you can do it, you know, once uh, uh, you can see, okay, this, these are the items I'm going to get. Will I make the purchase or not? And make the decision. If you don't, then you can just, you know, cancel it and don't, don't make a uh, purchase anything. And then you can do it once a week. Or there is kind of like a pity mechanic tied into it. So if you pull five times, so you actually make five transactions, then again, you get another, you know, preview one. But this kind of like a mechanic is interesting, uh, uh, kind of like a showcasing uh, uh, or like giving players uh, more transparency in that sense. Another example game that is using is it's also from Tencent, but it's actually on China market. Uh, they made this uh, kind of like a version for the team fight tactics uh, riots riots uh, auto chess game. Uh, they made uh, their own version, uh, uh, golden spatula uh, for the Chinese markets. <laughs> and uh, it's been doing really well. And, but they have been also, for example, trying out this type of a mechanic. So interesting, kind of like a twist uh, and, and kind of like, like a bit more transparent in that sense. Um, and overall, like the whole discussion about the, the gotchas and the transparency uh of them we you know we got the odds for the gotchas uh not that long ago it, it, it like uh when that had to be disclosed but there are still a li little bit so sometimes you know uh, things that are not so transparent in those mechanics so for for example in in call of duty you know like i talked about the main revenue they make is from the gotchas and they have for example this mechanic of kind of like a uh, Limited time gacha, which you pull, and then each time you get a reward that gets removed from the reward pool, but the actual price goes up every single time you make the pull. And then the most unique one actually is super, super, super low uh, kind of like a chance. So you get the feeling that you are moving towards a little bit, but then the price goes up and the price rises are not disclosed itself. It says that, you know, price is going up, but it's not disclosed itself. So so naturally, kind of like a, this kind of like a more maybe transparency uh, with the, you know, all the all the talk about the gotchas uh, and so on. I don't think it's ever going to go away. It's it's I, I don't uh, it, it's it is such a permanent part uh, of, of the monetization for for all of those type of games. Uh, but yeah, uh, some kind of a transparency uh, kind of like a more and more these mechanics get tweaks and new things are coming. So 
uh, I would assume, uh, are coming uh, also. So you mentioned the West at least where, where EA and Activision, who are obviously two of the biggest games companies and, and, and most, uh, I guess, two that are most vulnerable to sort of government legislation around that. And I guess, so, so I guess it's, those are the ones who are going to make a, a particular effort to to to, to um, be more transparent. I, I guess. I mean, I, I you know, it, it seems to be one of these things that, that the you know has been rumbling on for years now about about sort of legislation and everyone, everyone's sort of saying it's coming soon but but, but never sort of does and, <laughs> and maybe just by sort of chipping away and making things more transparent and letting people sort of see that then that's sort of actually enough we mentioned about like the limited time gadgets and like how powerful they are in the cosmetic monetized games and we talk about the hybridization a bit so i think like really kind of interesting trend as well as looking at some casual games that have started also using uh limited time gacha monetization like Maybe not as their as huge part as in let's say Call of Duty Mobile or Garena Free Fire, but like still you know to add on top of that uh, to add some extra monetized layer. So Cooking Diaries, interesting example. So they have this uh, cosmetic meta layer on top of the other meta layers in the game. So you collect uh, nice uh, outfits for your avatar character, uh, which and which basically many of those outfits are. You can also purchase them. Choose this. Limited time gotchas. There's not really any special mechanics or anything, but it's just the, you know the limited time and you know uh, brings that extra exclusivity to those cosmetics and also redecor. So it's this basically this uh, room decorating game. Basically, core game is all about room decorating, and then there's this meta layer where you're collecting these uh, different decoration styles that you can use them to decorate. So, and many of those uh, decoration styles, especially when they bring new sets, new ones, they are monetized through uh, limited time gotchas. But actually just quickly on top of that, uh, all the other uh, different interesting mechanics that Erno mentioned, I want to touch upon the engagement gotchas that we have seen. Like that's kind of like, I don't know if that's even the perfect name for it, but they are a bit, bit of kind of engagement gotchas. So, and gotchas that you don't actually directly purchase the gotcha pool for. So Diablo Immortal, of course, <laughs> really uh, sort of talk about game in terms of the gotcha. So in Diablo Immortal gotchas, the gotcha doesn't work in a way that you just buy it and then you get something, but you're actually buying these premium keys, then you insert to uh, sort of this dungeon thing, you insert them there, then you complete this really quick dungeon and then you get the loot. So there's kind of this, playing little playing uh, mode or playing this through this level like in middle of it so that's kind of definitely compared to normal gotchas some, something totally different but still the gacha element is still there and also pokemon unite i think has maybe even more unique ones so in pokemon unite you basically gain gacha pools by playing the game itself that's the only way you can gain gacha pools you have to play uh to gain this energy to your kind of this machine and when the machine is full, you can pull the gacha. But the but the thing here is that uh, you can there's a limit per week how many times you can pull from the gacha. And what is monetized then is that you can purchase extra gacha pulls, so extra energy capacity. If you want to play more and pull more, you can purchase that uh, directly. I guess in general, the reason that gachas are so interesting is or, or so important for monetization is is they are sort of the the, the key way that basically they are sort of un, uncapped ways of spending. So if you are a whale in the game who has to have everything then you know <laughs> gatches gatches are absolutely designed to take all the money you can throw at them i mean that's sort of sort of so um I, you know that that's battle passes i guess were sort of designed to, to sort of have these lower levels of monetization that people who weren't going to spend you know tons but felt like they were sort of making some progress but there are clearly some people who are, who are very rich or very uh interested in the game or, or both who just have to have everything and 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 gatches that's that's the reason everyone's got them because that's how you, the easiest way of sort of self def, self defining whales are gonna gonna keep keep, keep pulling until until they've, they've got everything. It's not a mechanic itself, but it's also interesting to study how kind of like a bundle offers actually have evolved and and there there are a lot of you know ways to create your bundle offers as well, and then you know the. Oh, naturally, it's the UI, UX, and and all that stuff uh, as well. But it can be kind of like interesting examples there, like mechanic-wise. So, good example is uh, these progressive IAP offers that uh, I think Royal Match was at least in my uh, idea was the first one who brought them, and then now they are really widely spread on the uh, all all across the casual genre. So basically, the idea is there that 
you can first claim free stuff and then you know the ui shows you that okay now make this purchase of 299 for example and then after that you can claim more, more free stuff so it's not basically you could make a like one individual bundle of all that thing and then you just make the purchase but like psychologically it feels that you are claiming free stuff and then if i make that purchase i'm gonna get even more free stuff even though it could be bundled under the same price tag uh but this type of a mechanic that royal match was i think was the first started used and now it's all around with coin masters and tune blast and many 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 other games are using the same kind of an idea uh, another one that uh, could be interesting uh, to highlight is to actually customize a customizable iap offers uh, this is again like coming back to the maybe more complex economies like afk arenas and these uh, mid-core hardcore games where you have so much stuff in your economy so much you know currency so much different things that you can upgrade your uh, characters with and uh, items and you name it and you name it but like we have seen this type of a thing uh, appearing as well giving kind of like a little bit of more player agency that okay there are three slots for this offer and then uh, th this is the kind of like a pool uh, from you can where you can uh, choose from then that dictates kind of like the price point uh, of, of, of the offer so kind of like a create your own bundle and then purchase that for your own specific needs uh, yeah uh, like mentioned afk arena raid shadow legends has been uh, using this as, as well they're just kind of like a couple uh, examples to throw around of kind of like uh, variations on just you know creating a different bundles and naturally there is the segmentation and, and uh, uh, targeting for specific users and so on but also like mechanically wise there are quite uh, you know uh, different ways to create your uh, just your basic iap uh, bundle offers you definitely see that becoming much more prevalent as you say the level of agency that sort of the, the the player feels by you know i want these specific things um obviously, obviously behind the scenes you have to be very clever about exactly what you're offering them at, at what price but again just the psychological sort of triggers of, of you feeling like you're in control probably means you're gonna spend more money which is sort of what the <laughs> game developer you know it's a win-win there the, the, the player's feeling better about what they're doing and they're spending more of course uh the targeting uh the bundle offer targeting systems are so sophisticated that they know that what are the things that you know uh, would be valuable for at that at that point or can give you those really very specific uh specific offers and so on but like that kind of a you know giving that choice uh maybe preference to the player is kind of like an interesting concept uh, is the future going to be just sort of the same as the past and then and sort of more of these things coming in or do you think some of them are gonna sort of become more relevant as as sort of time goes on one thing that i'm really looking forward to see and and, and analyze is definitely the the web store monetization part which is because that's it's a big thing uh for many uh the, the fees are big and the, the, you know toughness of the market nowadays uh, overall and and, and uh, you know profits going down with all, all on the whole market and so on so it, any way of kind of like uh, increasing your uh, uh, profits uh, fr from your game it's it's an interesting interesting uh, kind of like a trend and and to be honest one key thing over there is as well like what's the adoption actually for the users because it's still it's there's friction uh, for having the web, web stores like you need to go outside of the app and, and, and so on. So how does it uh, actually people and players of different genres, how they uh, adapt uh, to that kind of thing. So that is definitely that the most interesting thing for like in terms of monetization, at least for me uh, to follow in, in, in the upcoming uh, year or so. I definitely agree. I think we will most likely see more uh, extra web stores in games, but I would say like many of these subjects that we talked about, or touched upon, uh, I, I will see many of these like trends continuing further uh, in, in the future. For example, uh, if we talk about the Paddle Pass plan monetization used in events. I think I personally think that's like super clever if you if you manage to like implement it correctly. So I would see more of games monetizing their events uh, through this. You know, you have the free layer and the premium layer. Mm, on top of that, I would say 
there will be probably some kind of change, like possibly some kind of changes being the gacha monetization, like maybe some games like we will, we just had Mario Kart uh, removing uh, gachas in the game. But also, honestly, on top of that, Wild Rift just added gachas to their Chinese version now just adding gachas or soon adding gachas to the Western version. So it's hard to say if gachas will be, you know, trending down or up. But of course, it's maybe, maybe there will be more transfers in the future in gachas. Maybe that's the key there. Um, and, you know, talking about cosmetic monetization, I think sort of as social elements and sort of these, maybe even some games nowadays, these sort of light metaverse elements, like the social hangout lobbies in, in some casual games or mid-core games are becoming more and more common and there's more social elements coming and well, they're already huge. I think that's like already boosting, but we're gonna boost the sort of cosmetic economy or cosmetic meta and the cosmetic monetization even further as players, you know, of course, Having social elements, players, other players seeing your character, your avatar makes your cosmetics more valuable. So I would see that coming, especially even like even to more some casual games. Like I think just I talk about Cooking Diary a couple of times already already here, but I think that's just a really great example of you know they have been able to make uh, that sort of cosmetic meta of customizing your avatar character like quite quite well uh, and and valuable and also. Stumble Guys is a really interesting game, but there's the uh, similar game to Stumble Guys in the Chinese top crossing ranks, really new one. So Egg Party. And I think that is, I would really recommend everyone to actually check what kind, that kind of game is. That's a really interesting iteration of the Stumble Guys slash Fall Guys. And they actually have this sort of, it feels kind of this metaverse lobby. So there's not really like a, this normal game menu, but there's actually this this, this lobby where players can hang out with each other and play around and go to different game modes inside the lobby. And, you know, and of course that, as the game is like really heavily cosmetic monetized, that only makes those cosmetics even like more appealing. And I would see possibly, you know, if hangout lobbies become more common in casual games, then the sort of cosmetic monetization probably becomes uh, more common as well. Yeah, no, two good points. I mean, it's very interesting, I guess without going into another whole podcast about metaverses and stuff, it is kind of weird that they are, they're seen as very specific sort of things, whereas actually, you know, as you say, a slightly, a slightly bigger version of a social lobby hangout that just sort of gets expanded over time ends up probably broadly similar to what we think they should be. But it's the question is, I guess, whether they're top down imposed by big media companies or whether they sort of bottom up grown by successful existing sort of interactive spaces or games so, um, but it, I, I guess definitely go back to your main point Erno. the the in, in terms of like the you know if you can if, if companies can get a sizable amount of their big spenders onto a web platform then clearly th there's just that gaining back of the 30 percent margin is going to be the one big sort of upside they can do i mean there's all these very clever things you can do to maybe increase monetization by five ten percent or something but something as, as clearly structural as like getting your big spenders getting their 30 percent back and obviously if you're logging them through your website you're getting all their personal data all that sort of stuff that basically people have given up to app stores for the last 10 years yeah definitely and if you look at the you know especially mid-core hardcore games nowadays launching pretty much all of them have some kind of a cross-play uh no possibility even like not necessarily just uh the you know web store but actually have a possibility to play play uh on your pc uh and then you know monetize from there and then you know bigger companies like plarium they have their own client and then you can pretty much play all of those uh, games um, uh, over there as well so definitely uh, kind of like this cross-platform play but also like you know in terms of the monetization this kind of like a uh possibilities uh, I would assume definitely happening more and more in the future and on that note I'll just say thank you very much Erno and uh, uh, Wilhelm um, excellent excellent research there really gone through in incredible detail <laughs> thank you thank you thank you and uh, thanks to you for uh, listening watching however you're consuming uh, the podcast every episode we are really digging into what's going on in the mobile um, game space as you can see despite being what are we now 10 years old as a, as, a, as a proper industry or longer than 10 years old now but sort of 10 years old as a sort of serious uh, place where people make a lot of money in in the game space um, still so much more uh, to come so, so many new business models and so many new games uh, to to be uh, developed and played so uh, please do subscribe uh, via your uh, podcast channel of choice come back next time see what's going on in the world of uh, mobile gaming see you then <laughs>